שלום. זה אה, עונג אה, וכבוד מיוחד לארח השנה את פרופסור פרנסואה בורגיניון אה, לשאת את ההרצאה המרכזית בכנס השנתי של התוכנית לכלכלה אה, וחברה שנושא אה, של השנה הוא אה, אי שוויון ועוני וזה תחום אה, התמחותו של פרופסור בורגיניון שהוא אה, מומחה בינלאומי מהשורה הראשונה. <laughs> פרופסור בורגיון ממזג בקריירה ארוכה ומפוארת הבנה תיאורטית עמוקה בנושאים האלה, עבודה אמפירית מדוקדקת שהניחה יסודות חשובים להבנת והכרת תופעות אלה בפועל ובחתך רחב של מדינות בכל העולם ועבודה מעשית בשאלות של מדיניות שבאה להתמודד עם בעיות של אה, עוני ואי שוויון אה, ברמה הגבוהה אה, ביותר. אה, פרופסור בורגיון מילא שורה של תפקידים ב-CNRS, המרכז הלאומי למחקר מדעי בצרפת, שימש יועץ לגופים אה, מרכזיים שונים, לרבות ה-OECD ועוד גופים רבים, ממשלות אה, בצרפת. אה, ובפרט אה, שימש ככלכלן הראשי וסגן נשיא בכיר בבנק העולמי. לאחרונה הוא עמד, עד לאחרונה הוא עמד בראש בית הספר לכלכלה של אה, אה, פריז. אה, הוענקו לו תארים, אה, אה, תארי כבוד רבים, תואר דוקטורט כבוד בשורה של אוניברסיטאות חשובות, אה, תוארי אה, כבוד של אה, ממשלת צרפת, לרבות אה, אביר אה, ליגיון הכבוד. ותקצר כאן העירייה לזכור את כל תרומתו הרבות שמסתרות על פני הביבליוגרפיה, רשימת הפרסומים, על פני עשרה עמודים צפופים. אני אזכיר רק את הספר האחרון שהוא כתב על גלובליז... גלובליזציה ואי שוויון שיצא לאחרונה בצרפתית ומהדורה מורחבת שלו תצא בקרוב באנגלית. ואני מניח שעל חלק ממסקנותיו יצאו ההרצאה שלו היום. אז לא, ללא שהות נוספת אני מזמין את פרופסור בורגיניון לשאת את דבריו. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to share with all of you the, this interest for uh, inequality and uh, poverty issues. Uh, I listen with very much interest to the previous presentations and the discussions, and I'm afraid that uh, my own presentation will be uh, much more pedestrian than uh, what you just heard, uh, certainly much less uh, technical and uh, Uh, much less uh, statistical. What uh, I intend to do is the following. I mean, I understand that uh, inequality and poverty are uh, important issues these days in Israel, that uh, the fact that uh, inequality has increased substantially over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, Uh, the fact that uh, poverty, as uh, noticed by or as uh, noted more exactly by the OECD, is uh, higher than uh, in uh, comparable uh, uh, countries in uh, the OECD is, uh, is a concern. And uh, I think that it is certainly quite important to try to think about what is behind that. And uh, what I've been asked by the organizers is to provide a broader perspective. As a matter of fact, inequality is increasing in Israel, but it is increasing in many countries uh, in the world. And uh, the issue really is to try to understand what is behind that. And uh, uh, this is what I will be uh, doing. This is a, a question I will be uh, trying to uh, analyze in uh, this uh, presentation, focusing here uh, essentially on developed countries in uh, the book that uh, Moshe referred to, I'm really looking at uh, the whole world, at emerging countries at the same time as developed countries, but today we'll be uh, concentrating on uh, developed countries. Uh, basically, the, the starting point is this view that uh, you certainly have heard that uh, one uh, stage or another, 
This is what I call the universally unequalizing globalization hypothesis. Today, we observe that inequality is increasing in a majority of developed countries after decades of stability. Uh, and we also observe that uh, uh, there is an increase in a number of emerging countries exactly during the same period. Hence, many people say this increase in inequality is coinciding with the last globalization wave, which is very intensive. Therefore, there must be some kind of causal relationship between globalization on the one hand and this increase in inequality. And then people jump immediately to the conclusion that inequality increase is essentially due to the fact that uh, globalization is uh, 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 producing this kind of change in the global economy and therefore in all the national economies within uh, the world. And uh, uh, to express this hypothesis directly, I would say that globalization, the major economic force affecting all economies in the world, is reshaping national economies and this is what is causing more inequality in those economies. Now, what is quite uh, uh, interesting and paradoxical is that it is true that inequality is increasing in many countries, yet when you look at global inequality in the world, that is when you put together all the uh, inhabitants of this planet and you look at the way in which inequality among them uh, has uh, changed, then you discover that it is exactly the opposite of increasing inequality. You discover that, as a matter of fact, over the last 20, 25 years, inequality has decreased. And this is a complete reversal of historical trend uh, when you look at the evolution of the global inequality since the early 19th century, you find that inequality is increasing and then it just started to uh, go down. But then another hypothesis is coming up which uh, 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 is an interesting one and which is related to a very well-known uh, theorem in uh, pure trade theory, which is a so-called factor equalization theorem uh, linked to the names of Heckscher, Olin, and Samuelson, which basically says that in a world of completely free trade, then under some conditions, and I will not get through those conditions, then what we should observe is that factor compensations should equalize across countries. And what people see in the process that we're observing today is exactly that. They see that income across countries are getting closer over time, but within countries, incomes are diverging. And the idea being that uh, wages of unskilled workers are getting uh, much closer in developed countries to what they are in emerging countries and uh, the return to capital is becoming the same in all countries in the world. So what we're observing is this equalizing of factors and therefore the fact that inequality which, in, which uh, existed across countries at one point of time now will be uh, progressively translated to inequality within country. So you had a lot of inequality between Ethiopia and United States, and if you push this argument very, very far, tomorrow there will be the same kind of inequality within the United States, and within Ethiopia, and within Europe, etc., etc. So this is something which uh, people have in mind, and so it is worth trying to think a little about what is behind that and to see whether uh, we can uh, find this kind of argument convincing. This is simply an illustration of the fact that inequality is decreasing in the world. So this is the global Gini coefficient in the world at the top, two definitions. I don't want to get into the detail of that, which is decreasing since uh, the uh, uh, early, uh, I mean, the middle of the 80s. And at the bottom, you have the average Gini coefficient in the G7 countries, which, as you can see, is definitely increasing. So the uh, point of the uh, uh, element for uh, the interrogation is what is behind that, and uh, can it be globalization? So the outline of this presentation will be the following. I will start with uh, 
uh, reviewing the kind of evidence that we have on inequality changes in developed countries. And you see that I want to look at different aspects of that inequality. Then I will get into what are the factors which may be behind that. And I will try to make a distinction between common factors, which may be globalization factors, and idiosyncratic factors, which may be specific to the various countries, and try to see whether uh, we can make uh, we can find the role of these different factors in the increase in inequality. And finally, as a conclusion, I would like to ask the very provocative question, which is, should we worry about this increase in inequality? And uh, you'll see why I'm asking this question. Let's start with a quick tour d'horizon of uh, inequality changes in uh, developed countries. First thing, we must be extremely careful with the data. Data are not completely comparable across countries. I don't have time to get into the detail of that, but uh, uh, people who have studied that, in particular people in the, uh, uh, who have worked in the Luxembourg Income Study uh, Program know very well that uh, even among developed countries, there are differences which make countries not fully comparable. Uh, so there have been very, serious improvements made uh, over time and those people in uh, LES has uh, worked on trying to make data as much uh, as uh, uh, comparable as much comparable as possible yet there are still uh, big differences and another problem we have when we look at the evolution is the fact that in many countries we have discontinuities in series the definition of income changes over time, the definition of the population over which inequality is being measured is changing over time. So there is a, a huge work to be done in order to make, uh, to construct series which are homogeneous. What I will be using here are essentially OECD data. They try to do the job, yet uh, uh, there are still some problems, but again, I don't have time to get into the detail of that. I also want to look at various aspects of the inequality. I will start with the Gini coefficient of equivalized disposable income, that is incomes after taxes and transfers, and equivalized means that uh, this is income per uh, consumption unit in households. These are not earnings, this is income per household uh, divided by the number of consumption units in the household. Uh, I also want to look at the evolution of the inequality of income before taxes and transfers, what we call market income, and this will be the second uh, uh, topic. Uh, and I also want to say a few words about another type of inequality, which is not very common when we deal with uh, uh, inequality, which is the GDP share of labor in uh, uh, national income, uh, which uh, I believe is playing a big role in explaining what is going on with inequality in many of these countries. So quickly a tour of what is going on in several groups of countries. So here you have uh, five or six points depending on the country we are looking at. Here you have the Anglo-Saxon countries, which are the champions of the increase in inequality and to some extent also are ranked rather high in the uh, international scale of inequality. So you have the US at the top, uh, then UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and you see that in all these countries, you have a very clear uh, trend, upward trend in the degree of inequality. Uh, and uh, this increase is substantial. Uh, in a country like the US, you see that in uh, 20 years, more or less, the uh, degree of inequality uh, uh, the Gini coefficient has increased by four points and the uh, increase is still higher in a country like uh, Australia. Four points in the Gini coefficient is something very big. Uh, in some countries, four points, four percentage points would correspond to the impact of the redistribution system. So it is something really quite substantial. Here is what we observe in uh, Western continental Europe. And uh, in the dotted line correspond to the few countries in the whole group where inequality is either constant or slightly decreasing. And you see that those two countries in continental Europe are France with uh, a drop 
uh, initially a drop and then an increase again. And if you were to continue the series, the uh, curve, we see that the increase is continuing. And Belgium, where there has been a big uh, uh, drop taking place over the last uh, uh, eight years. But Germany, uh, Netherlands, Austria are three countries where the increase in inequality has been very substantial over the last uh, uh, 15 or 20 years. Here you have the champions of equality, the Nordic countries. And uh, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, the four Nordics. And you can see that in those countries, inequality is very low. The scale, the, uh, the vertical scale is always the same in all those charts. But you see that definitely the trend is an upward trend. And again, it is not small uh, increase. When you look at a country like Sweden, the Gini coefficient 1985 in Sweden was 0.22. Uh, today it is, point tw it is uh, more than 0.25. So uh, this increase is very substantial. And again, if you were to continue that uh, series, we would uh, find something still higher in uh, the case of Sweden. So, uh, and Finland is uh, probably the a country where the change is still much more important. And finally, a few Mediterranean countries, and uh, I put Israel among those Mediterranean countries. And uh, don't ask me why you have Japan here. I had to put Japan somewhere. So uh, I put it uh, there. Um, and uh, again, you see that there are a few countries where inequality is stagnant or decreasing, Spain and Greece uh, and Japan. But then Italy, Portugal, and Israel are countries where inequality is increasing. And in the case of Israel, and this is a, a point uh, which I guess I had missed uh, before uh, re-looking uh, at uh, this uh, uh, chart again, uh, if you look at, uh, uh, if we were to go back to the first chart, you would see that Israel is just below the United States and uh, above uh, Portugal. So definitely among the developed countries, uh, in terms of disposable income, Israel is very, is very, very high. And again, you see that the increase, according to this series, the OECD series, which is uh, uh, officially uh, uh, checked by the uh, uh, Israeli authorities uh, and which are being used by the OECD, uh, we see that uh, the increase which took place over the last 20 years is very substantial. So this is what we observe in this uh, 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 Gini coefficient for equivalized uh, disposable income. This is a summary of all this uh, between uh, the mid 80s and the mid 2000 uh, or 2008, which is the uh, last uh, uh, data point available and which is quite okay because it is just before the crisis. You see that in all those countries, the Gini coefficient has increased and has increased quite a lot in uh, different, uh, uh, different countries. Over, overall, the change is quite, uh, quite dramatic. This is an additional point I want to make because this is something which is not uh, always clear in the mind of the people. This shows the following for the United States, but I could have drawn the same kind of curve for other countries. This shows the evolution of inequality at the top of the distribution and at the bottom of the distribution. D9 over D5 is a ratio of the 19th uh, percent uh, quantile over the median, and uh, D1 over D5 is the ratio of the tenth uh, percentile over the median. Uh, so this means the distance from the median of the top and at the bottom. And what you observe here is that uh, when you start in uh, 1975 in the US, initially you have inequality increasing both at the top and at the bottom. You have this divergence with respect to the middle. But then the bottom is more or less recovering or stagnating where the top keeps increasing. And what we observe in many uh, developed countries today is the fact that very much of the increase in the inequality is taking place at the very top of the distribution. And this is something that we have to keep in mind when we try to think for an explanation of what is going on. This is definitely something that we uh, uh, want to, to, to have in mind. And I'll come back to this uh, uh, chart uh, uh, a bit later. 
Let me change definition of inequality. This is inequality of market income. This is a share of uh, the top 5% in total market income. And this is a historical series between 1920 and 2009. This is taken from the top income database, which was put together initially by Tony Atkinson and uh, Thomas Piketty, and uh, which is available uh, on, the, on the web. And uh, you see the very, very uh, uh, interesting evolution of the time, this U-curve of inequality before uh, taxes, uh, the US the blue curve uh, today has uh, the degree uh, of inequality which had gone down uh, quite substantially between the beginning of the 20th century and the middle of the 20th century is now back to where it was more or less a century ago. And we have the same evolution in the UK, we have the same evolution in Japan, we have uh, the same evolution in Sweden, also starting from a much, uh, much lower level. And in France, we have something which is much milder, but we have again an evolution. We have a, an increase taking place in the uh, recent uh, past. And if we were to continue until 2012, then the increase in the case of France would be much uh, stronger. So here, we have uh, something which is uh, uh, telling us that uh, certainly before taxes, something very uh, important is taking place at the very top of the distribution, and that we have a very common evolution in all those countries of the degree of inequality. And you can also see that uh, the tax system is making a difference. When you look at Japan, remember that in the previous uh, chart, Japan was a country where inequality was not uh, showing any uh, uh, trend over the last uh, 15 years, where here we see that there is a, a, an increase. This means that the, the tax system is definitely uh, doing some correction, but uh, uh, it is important to realize that uh, market incomes are definitely showing uh, this big increase in inequality. And the last piece of evidence I would like to remind you about is this uh, change in the functional distribution of uh, national income, or GDP. Here we have for the more as the G7 countries, we have the evolution of the uh, uh, share of labor in uh, GDP. And we see that, again, we have a very strong uh, downward trend, uh, which, which is quite substantial uh, uh, until from uh, the uh, mid-80s uh, 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 until now. And uh, this is important because immediately you can see that this can be related to the previous slide in the sense that because we know that capital income tends to accrue to the top of the distribution more than to the bottom of the distribution, there could be some relationship between that evolution of the functional distribution in favor of capital and the evolution of the uh, inequ personal income inequality that uh, uh, we observe before taxes. So this is the uh, end of uh, this uh, quick tour d'horizon. So what we observe, we have a strong common and equalizing trend which is very much due to the top of the distribution over the last one or two decades. We have to realize that when we look at the time path, and I will not go back to the slides, but the time paths time path were not parallel. It was not the case that inequality was increasing in all countries at the same time. It was increasing in one country at some time period, in another country at another time period. So it would be very difficult to say that there is some kind of global force which suddenly uh, shock, I mean, hit uh, all the countries at the same time and produce this increase in inequality. So this leads us to, be, to believe or to think that there must be some kind of idiosyncrasis in the way in which inequality has increased uh, over time. At the same time, we observe several exceptions. We have seen the case of Belgium, we have seen the case of Spain, we have seen the case of France, and uh, in the case of France, uh, we can ask ourselves whether this is an exception or whether this is a delay in the evolution of uh, inequality. As I said before, when we look at the most recent data, it is true that inequality keeps increasing in France after decades 
of uh, uh, not only not stagnation but decline, uh, decades of uh, uh, decline. So this is what we observe, and because of uh, the uh, uh, this uh, observation of, I mean, the uh, conclusion of this tour d'horizon, I think that there is a need to distinguish between what can be common forces behind those evolution and what can be uh, truly idiosyncratic and uh, uh, possibly whether there are links between them. Uh, by that, what I mean is that is it okay that common factors are present in all countries, but countries will react in a different way to an external shock? Or is it the case that there is something really specific taking place in some countries at some specific period? So let me move to the second part of the presentation, which uh, we will try to uh, <coughs> think or reflect on those factors for distributional uh, changes. The common factors almost by definition should be factors which affect all countries at the same time and it is difficult not to think about the forces of globalization uh, and again even though this uh, uh, the impact of globalization may have a different impact depending on the country we are looking at but looking at all developed countries at the same time it is quite likely that the impact of globalization should be comparable across countries. When we think about idiosyncratic factors, we might think about exogenous changes in country, uh, in uh, uh, the specific environment of uh, countries. We may think about the business cycle, which may not be the same in different countries, although certainly the last one is a common business cycle. We might think about demography. Uh, we might think about uh, Japan being a country which is aging very quickly, or Germany, a country which is aging very quickly, and this has an impact on the distribution. We may think about other factors, like uh, the general degree of competitiveness of uh, the countries, which may be something uh, completely specific uh, uh, to, to, to the countries in a given uh, global environment. We may also think about all the policies which are affecting directly or indirectly the distribution of income, the distribution of wealth, the distribution of human capital, and which are, again, specific to uh, the various countries. The tax system, as far as I know, is specific to countries. And this is definitely something which belongs to uh, the sovereign states. And we'll come back, of course, to that uh, issue uh, later. The uh, decision about uh, uh, the way in which the labor market is regulated is, uh, again, something which is country-specific, and reforms of the labor market are definitely country-specific and may have an impact on the distribution. And this is the kind of uh, factor that we like to look at under this uh, title of idiosyncratic factors. And the other changes that we observe are the result of uh, uh, a complex combination of all these uh, factors. So let's review them quickly in uh, a turn, and uh, I certainly don't have uh, time to get into the detail of that. There is, uh, on all of them, there is uh, a rather huge literature, and uh, uh, I will simply try to summarize what this literature says. Globalization, the first thing is, of course, is trade. And the expansion of trade, which has been quite amazing over the last uh, 30 years, uh, 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 trade has uh, increased, the volume of trade has increased much more rapidly than uh, the volume of GDP in the world. And in particular, the North-South trade has been uh, uh, exploding literally over the last uh, 30 years. And in the discussion about increased inequality, the first uh, uh, focus uh, which goes back to the 90s, and uh, this is more or less essentially uh, U.S. Uh, literature, was really on the impact of this North-South trade on the degree of inequality. And the story was the one I just mentioned right at the beginning. This is competition uh, between North and South. The fact that opening up uh, trade to, to the South, or the South, in particular China and uh, later on India, opening up to world trade. Uh, this meant that uh, unskilled workers in developed countries uh, were competed out by unskilled workers in uh, China or India. And then, of course, because of that, the uh, salary of uh, the wage of uh, those workers uh, went down. 
in countries where there was uh, some uh, wage rigidity, it might not have been wage going down, but uh, unemployment uh, going up. More recently, the competition moved, uh, was upgraded. Instead, today we could say that to some extent, uh, the competition between on unskilled work is, uh, is done. Uh, all uh, the uh, industries uh, relatively intensive in unskilled labor have been relocated into uh, emerging countries. Uh, and uh, we still have unskilled workers in developed countries, but those unskilled workers are working in non-traded sectors, basically in services, very often in personal services, rather than on traded goods. So uh, this means that the competition has a changed level. And uh, today, with uh, uh, in particular the uh, intermediate services offshoring, when uh, banks have uh, their uh, uh, accountants uh, located in uh, Chennai, in India, or uh, uh, in uh, uh, some in uh, Nairobi, uh, for uh, 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 in uh, some cases in the, uh, in, in, in the UK, uh, then basically this is emerging countries uh, uh, w uh, competing uh, with the semi-skilled uh, workers in developed countries. This time it is not anymore unskilled workers. These are people who uh, are employees who uh, have uh, uh, certainly, uh, in very uh, many cases, college education, or certainly uh, have uh, uh, finished uh, high school who are competing uh, with uh, the uh, emerging countries. And this might explain why uh, in the distribution of uh, wages, the bottom part, unskilled workers and some semi-skilled workers have been affected by the competition with the rest of the world, with the emerging countries. And this may explain why the upper part of the distribution is gaining, whereas the bottom part is, uh, is, uh, is losing. This may also explain why uh, the D1 over D5, when you look at the bottom of the distribution with respect to the median, this is not changing so much, basically because this corresponds to the two-stage unskilled workers and then more skilled workers uh, uh, competing with uh, uh, emerging uh, countries. Now, there's been a huge discussion about uh, this in the literature, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Uh, uh, when I will be talking about technical progress, which was the alternative explanation to those movements. But I would like to mention that this North-South uh, trade, I mean, the, the uh, attention has been focused on North-South trade, but uh, ignoring to some extent the fact that during the same period, the competition between Northern countries increased a lot. And uh, in particular, I belong to a country uh, which is part of a wider union where uh, competition has increased enormously when the European single market was uh, created. So from a day to the next, companies in uh, uh, Europe were producing for the whole union and were competing with, uh, directly with all the companies in, uh, uh, in Europe. And this definitely should have had an impact on uh, the uh, way in which uh, companies restructured their production, the way in which they relocated their uh, production sites in different countries, etc. So we should not uh, forget uh, this, uh, ignore this uh, uh, impact. And lately in the trade literature, there is a so-called new, new trade literature uh, and in this new, new trade literature, the emphasis is about firms. And the idea is to say there is an heterogeneity among firms, and firms which are exporting are not the same as firms producing for the domestic market. They are more competitive, they are paying higher wages, and if trade is expanding, this means that you'll have more uh, heterogeneity among firm, firms in a given country, and because of that, you may have more uh, inequality. And this is, uh, a lot of people these days are working on this, and this has been a, a kind of latecomer among the possible explanation for the increase in inequality linked to, to trade. Technical progress is, uh, uh, again, 
a, a very good candidate to explain the increase in inequality and the fact that uh, uh, technical progress uh, has been found to be heavily skill biased. And uh, because of that, uh, uh, technical progress required more and more skilled workers, less and less unskilled workers, and then therefore the uh, skill differential uh, uh, was uh, increased uh, very much, and this was a big debate during the 90s. During the 90s, and I cite here the uh, Krugman, the big debate was, is it the case that the increase in inequality observed in the United States is due to north-south trade, or is it due to technical progress? And there was a big debate with uh, uh, people arguing that it was more north-south trade and other people arguing that it was more uh, technical progress. In one very famous paper, Krugman in uh, 1995 said 20% for north-south trade, 80% for uh, technical progress. And then lately, two years or three years ago, uh, he uh, came back to that issue and he said, okay, today, uh, if I had to redo the same exercise as I did uh, uh, 10 years or 15 years ago, then I would uh, conclude that it is much more for North-South trade than uh, it was the case, basically because uh, uh, since uh, 90, the early 1990s, the, uh, the North-South trade expanded enormously, and therefore the competition coming from emerging countries is much uh, bigger than uh, it was uh, then. Now, Should I continue? Okay, I don't want to get into this debate, which is a long debate, which is a huge literature. Uh, the point I want to make is, for, I mean, certainly technical progress is playing a huge role. We are all uh, uh, witness of uh, this uh, incredible change that was linked to technical progress. Now, the point I wanted, the question I wanted to make is the following. Is technical progress truly independent from globalization? Isn't it the case that because of globalization, I mean, because of enhanced competition between firms, between countries, isn't it the case that the rate, the pace of technical progress has very much increased over the recent years? If this is the case, we cannot really consider that uh, technical progress came from heaven at some stage, and then we have to do with it. Uh, we have to take into account the fact that the way in which our global economy works is such that not only technical progress is spreading all over the countries in the world, but it is generating more competition, and it is also generated by more competition across uh, firms. This is an issue some uh, uh, I.O. people work on uh, this kind of issue. Uh, again, I cannot uh, get into the detail of that, but I think this is something important. And there are other aspects of technical progress which are not uh, so much uh, emphasized in the, the literature on inequality, but yet may explain uh, the, uh, some uh, increase in inequality uh, uh, observed in the recent, uh, 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 recent past. Economies of scale permitted by technical progress. The fact that today, because of the communication technology, you have much bigger firms, uh, you have this uh, fragmentation of uh, the supply chain, uh, the fact that because of the communication technology, uh, uh, finance operators, traders are operating with much bigger portfolios. What does that mean? This means that those people are managing much bigger operations. Now think about those people being remunerated as a percentage of their uh, contribution to the profit of those operations. Because the size of those operations is increasing, the uh, compensation of those people is increasing. You have this theory about CEO payment, which basically says CEOs are paid on the basis of the size of the operation that they, they do. And indeed, in any country, you observe that there is a very clear relationship between the size of the firms and the pay of the CEOs. Mm -hmm. So this is, again, linked, or this may be linked, to the uh, technical progress in the sense that those people can operate on much larger scales. Another very, very obvious example is the example of the rock stars or uh, movie stars, uh, the audience of which, of whom, have uh, has increased enormously because of 
the technology and uh, those people now are reaching a much bigger audience or uh, football uh, stars are reaching a much bigger audience than this was the case before and definitely this contributed to increasing this is the kind of winner takes all uh, uh, kind of story um, this uh, has increased the concentration of income at the top of the distribution factor mobility is another part of uh, globalization uh, so you have for indirect investment the fragmentation of the uh, uh, supplier chain which definitely has benefited uh, capital owners. I mean, the reason why uh, big companies decided to relocate their uh, production in different countries, the reason why now you have uh, uh, in any uh, industrial pro uh, pro uh, uh, product, you have the uh, uh, compositions, geographical composition of uh, inputs which are coming from many, many countries. This was done simply to increase profit, and therefore this uh, uh, must benefit uh, capital Capital, and uh, from that point of view, there is a link with the uh, drop in the labor share that we have seen uh, a little earlier in the Tour d'Horizon. Uh, when we look at uh, labor, we have also to recognize that uh, more and more there is a global labor market for highly skilled labor. Uh, we observe uh, the experience I had uh, uh, when working in the World Bank and the uh, 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 traveling through many uh, countries, uh, you go to Africa and uh, you look at uh, the kind of uh, salary that is being paid to a minister of finance and you find that uh, this salary in real terms is not very far away from what uh, this uh, person could get in Wall Street or was getting very often in the World Bank or in the IMF and generally this person is coming from Wall Street, is coming from the IMF, and uh, when uh, he was or she was hired by the president, uh, this person said, okay, I'm coming, but I want the same standard of living as I had when I was in Washington or when I was in uh, New York. This is something very common. And we know and we can see the mobility of high-skilled people around the world, and this must have been uh, contributed in countries which were slightly behind in terms of compensation of those people, this must have contributed to an increase in inequality in those countries. Migration of unskilled workers is very country specific. Uh, it is probable that in the US, uh, the fact that uh, we have uh, uh, migration has been quite important, illegal migration quite important, has probably contributed to an increase in inequality. Uh, this is not necessarily the case in uh, other countries where uh, the uh, migrant, the flow of migrants is much better controlled. So because of that, I don't want to get into the detail of this. And finally, there is this financialization, the so-called financialization uh, process that has been observed uh, in the world again over the last uh, 20 years or so. The expansion of the financial sector is, a, is something which is common to most countries in the world and uh, the uh, uh, increase in uh, the compensation of uh, financial operators is again something which is observed in uh, most countries in the world and already said something about uh, this. And uh, uh, I already also said something about the CEOs uh, but there is, for the CEOs, a double uh, uh, evolution. One is the fact that they are very often operating with much bigger f firms. But a big change which took place, and which is linked to the financialization, is that shareholders have, to some extent, changed the way in which CEO compensation was determined. In the old days, I mean, you may remember JP Morgan uh, saying, uh, I will never lend money to a company where the CEO is earning more than 12 times what the lowest paid worker is earning, okay? From 12, we are now at 350. What is the big change? The big change is that in the JP Morgan's day, CEOs were workers. They were salaried workers at a very high level, but they were salaried workers. Today, they are more uh, linked to the value of the firms. Shareholders are asking CEOs to increase the value of the firm and because of that they are basing their compensation on the value of the firm. And suddenly because the uh, uh, market uh, uh, um, stock markets boomed 
uh, during the uh, 90s and uh, the uh, 2000, at least the first part of the 2000, uh, because of that, CEOs uh, pay uh, increase quite a lot. This is part of the financialization in the sense that the finance uh, uh, motivation is uh, responsible for that and finance is weighing more and more in the way in which uh, economic uh, uh, systems do work. These are what we can say, and again, we can elaborate on each one of these uh, factors, uh, but each one is definitely contributing or may contribute to the uh, increase in inequality observed in uh, many countries. Now, what about idiosyncratic forces and reforms in uh, redistribution policies uh, across developed countries? Redistribution, the first uh, uh, part of distribution in t is taxes. One very important phenomenon among developed countries, and I understand that Israel is no exception, is the fact that in all these countries you observe that the tax system became less progressive over time. In all countries, you had a very, very substantial decrease in the top marginal tax rate uh, uh, of the income tax. In many countries, uh, the governments uh, uh, withdrew from uh, estate uh, taxes, withdrew from wealth taxes. Uh, France, from that point of view, is an exception. Uh, but uh, we observe that in all countries, uh, and this started uh, in, the, in the US in uh, uh, the uh, very famous uh, 1986 uh, reform, in all countries you have this movement toward less progressivity. And of course, this uh, produced an increase in inequality uh, in a very automatic way. This is something which is quite general. When we look at the other side of redistribution, social benefits, the way in which uh, social transfers are being made to low-income uh, households, things are not that uh, uh, homogeneous. You have countries which decided to cut on some transfers, for example, the reforms in Germany in the early 2000s to uh, uh, make the labor market much more flexible, the so-called hard sphere reforms definitely were uh, a kind of cut in the welfare state in uh, Germany, and this contributed definitely to increasing inequality. But this is not something that you observe in all countries, in all developed countries. In many countries, the uh, welfare state at the bottom of the distribution is remaining uh, quite, uh, quite active. So we cannot say that this is something general, but it is the okay case that in some countries this uh, took place. Market regulation. Financial markets, probably there is no need to uh, uh, insist too much about this. There has been a major deregulation in most countries. And this was also, again, something completely linked to globalization. Uh, when in one country it was uh, 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 deposit banks were allowed to be at the same time investment banks, uh, it was very difficult to other countries not to do the same thing uh, if uh, they wanted to stay in the competition uh, of, uh, 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 in the financial uh, world. And uh, uh, because of that, uh, this is something which was a, a domestic uh, uh, policy measure, but which was linked to the globalization. Labor market. The reforms have been quite heterogeneous across countries, and uh, 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 in some countries, like Germany, as uh, just mentioned, it is possible to link the increase in equality to some of these reforms, but again, there is nothing very general there. It is simply one area where, it is, uh, where reforms may have produced an increase in inequality. And product market, it's much more difficult to say very much about the impact of uh, deregulation and privatization of product markets on inequality. So because of that, I don't want to insist on this. And finally, distribution of assets. Uh, OK, education. We had uh, a presentation on education a little earlier on, uh, uh, for Israel. Uh, again, there we can we observe very heterogeneous policies. And we observe that policies uh, may have uh, some uh, impact on, uh, the, uh, on, on, on the degree of inequality. In, uh, uh, in the case of France, for example, the recent uh, result of the PISA survey is showing that uh, uh, because of the way in which the uh, uh, educational system works, or the uh, policies uh, 
behind the judicial system, we have this uh, increasing variance between the bottom of the uh, distribution of uh, scores uh, of students and the very top. The very top is at the top of the world, but the very bottom is much lower than the bottom, uh, uh, not maybe the very bottom of the world, but not too far away. So we have policies which contributed to a polarization of uh, 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 education, and uh, this certainly has some responsibility for some aspect of inequality. And of course, estate uh, inheritance taxes, wealth taxes, uh, have been uh, uh, present in several countries. Uh, there have been reforms. In Sweden, for example, there is this very interesting uh, story about uh, the uh, owner of IK, the uh, well-known uh, furniture company, uh, which uh, wanted to uh, transmit the whole company to his uh, children, but uh, there was a very huge inheritance tax in uh, Sweden. So he said, fine. If you ask me to pay this inheritance tax, then I know that the company will be dismantled because there is no way that uh, uh, the tax can be paid without uh, cutting uh, down the company into pieces. Under these conditions, I prefer to leave Sweden. And he did. And then a few years later, uh, the, uh, the uh, Swedish government decided to abolish the inheritance tax. So this is, I think, an interesting uh, thing. And this also shows that this necessarily will have an impact on the evolution of the distribution of assets in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Sweden. I've been uh, shown the uh, time uh, panel, so let me accelerate. I've almost, I'm almost done. One point is the fact that we have strong interaction between globalization forces and its redistributional policies. Sorry. What is going on here? Okay. The first thing we have to see that many policies were introduced in several countries using globalization as a motivation. In many countries, the reason why the corporate uh, tax rate has been uh, reduced was essentially because of globalization. And the argument was to say, if you don't do it, then companies will uh, move in another country. These days, we have uh, the same thing with the income tax. In France, you may know that uh, this government uh, wanted to introduce a 75% tax rate on uh, incomes above 1 million euros. And uh, uh, a well-known uh, movie star decided that uh, he would be uh, going to live in Russia rather than uh, to uh, uh, remain in, uh, in, in France. This is the extreme, and this is maybe uh, a movie. This is a show business. But uh, there is something of this type. Today, it is OK that countries uh, would uh, uh, hesitate in uh, doing that. And this is the second point that globalization imposes severe constraints on policy instruments. Uh, and uh, uh, because of that, today it is very difficult for a country to decide about a very uh, progressive uh, income tax policy because the risk is simply for people to leave the country. And uh, uh, this means that uh, those policies may be possible, but only in a coordinated way. And uh, uh, we know that uh, coordination of tax policies across countries is very difficult. Let me conclude uh, with this. So what we have seen is that definitely there are common forces linked to globalization which push inequality uh, uh, upward. We have seen that some policies decided at the country level went in the same direction. Some other maybe went in the opposite direction. Uh, and uh, those policies, in some cases, were linked to globalization or, to some extent, are constrained by globalization. So what should we uh, conclude? And uh, in a provocative way, I want to ask whether we should worry about this. Definitely, we have the feeling that there must be a limit toward, uh, to uh, the level of inequality. but. What is quite surprising is to see that there is a kind of disconnection between the actual increase in inequality and the perceived change in inequality in the public opinion. And this is something that uh, we want to uh, uh, take uh, uh, on board. For example, 
there was a survey not a long time ago about the perception of inequality and the fairness of societies in various developed countries and also some emerging countries. And uh, in the case of the US, the majority of Americans found that their society was very fair, despite the fact that the Gini coefficient is the highest for the United States. And they felt that uh, inequality in the country had not changed over the last 10 years, when as a matter of fact, it exploded. And uh, symmetrically, in the case of France, you had a large majority of the people finding that their society was very unfair, despite the fact that the Gini coefficient is much lower than in the uh, US. And at the same time, that inequality had very much increased over the last 10 years, whereas inequality had not changed. So this means that there is a disconnection. And this means that the kind of inequality that uh, matters in uh, the mind of uh, the people may not be exactly the kind of inequality that we are measuring with our Gini coefficient uh, and uh, other uh, uh, instruments. Uh, in particular, we know, and uh, I will uh, not go over all the conclusion because it would take uh, very much time, we know that there is a difference between uh, considering inequality of opportunities and inequality of results. Uh, and uh, the difference between the US and France is probably the fact that in the US, the implicit concept of inequality is inequality of opportunities. You can become Bill Gates, you can become Steve Jobs, you can become Jeff Zuckerberg in the United States. This means that starting from nothing, you can get to the very top. And this is what matters. Now, actually, sociologists say that things are changing, but this, for a long time, this has been the way in which the US citizens were looking at inequality. In France, it is exactly the opposite. You look at the result, and you have rich people, and we have a president who once, during his uh, electoral campaign, said, uh, I am the enemy of the rich people. So uh, these are definitely different philosophies. And uh, probably when, uh, as economists, we think about what is wrong with inequality and the fact that at some stage uh, inequality cannot increase beyond some uh, level, what we have in mind is a concept which may not be exactly the concept that, uh, 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 that uh, the public opinion may have. Another example linked to that, Occupy Wall Street, a movement against inequality, clearly. Indignados in, uh, uh, in uh, Spain, again, a movement against maybe not inequality, but unemployment and inequality linked to unemployment. Uh, what did happen to those movements? They simply uh, petered out and uh, not very much happened. So I know that uh, the uh, social protest in uh, Israel was uh, probably much uh, more long lived, uh, but it was not a protest on inequality. Uh, and the same way in Chile, the students didn't protest against inequality. So the point I wanted to make here, and let me go directly to the main conclusion. Uh, the problem is whether we want to, uh, uh, whether we believe that somehow we are going back to uh, the uh, beginning of the 20th century, that we're moving back to a society where uh, there was a lot of inequality in opportunities, in results, and uh, what we're observing today in the figures, in the uh, data, is this kind of movement, and, uh, uh, and whether this is unacceptable by societies, uh, until when uh, this uh, can be, uh, until where this uh, can go, what is the kind of tolerance that uh, societies have for this kind of inequality? And uh, uh, this is, I think, a big uh, question, which is more sociological question than an economic question. Uh, but may I also ask ourselves whether uh, there is, we are close to the limit and whether it will not be time to adopt uh, co corrective policies. But as I said before, those policies must necessarily be coordinated. Sorry to have gone, to have rushed uh, uh, throughout the end of this presentation. I've been uh, too ambitious. And uh, I'll stop here and uh, thank you very much for your attention. much to uh, Professor Bourguignon. We'll uh, take questions after the uh, panel. Uh, Professor Bourguignon will also take part. And so keep your questions in
בית 